This time on the Highland Woodworker, we're calling it a hybrid workshop. A closer look at how these instrument makers are combining high-tech and precision hand and power tools to build these great looking guitars. And that's just from years of rain running down the vertical grain. Plus, Fine Woodworking Magazine's John Tetro has the finer points of making a reclaimed wood project come together. So you built this door? This is one of our doors, yeah. And, uh, I thought it was 150 <laughs> Good. years old. Good. Yeah. Mich mission accomplished. Then spend a moment with master furniture maker Robert Johnson, a third generation craftsman whose work is so impressive he became an icon on Main Street in Memphis, Tennessee. These stories and more this time on the Highland Woodworker. Hello, I'm Charles Brock and I'm a Highland Woodworker. I just love coming to Highland Woodworking in Atlanta, Georgia. It's where I get all my fine woodworking tools and a great woodworking education. Hey Chuck, how's it going? Hello Ed Sit. Uh, Ed, you know, it's hard for a, uh, a woodworker to cut a straight line with a dovetail saw. And uh, I haven't acquired the knack yet. Is there something that can help me that, that you have? I think we have a guide by David Barron and it's going to allow you to keep that saw right on the line. It's a dovetail saw guide and it's going to make life a lot easier for you. That's wonderful. I need all the help I can get. But first, we're in Bell Buckle, Tennessee, the home of Waldron Music, and there are some beautiful guitars that are made here. Let's go inside and see how they make them in a hybrid shop. Eric Waldron. Hey, how are you? This is a beautiful collection of guitars that you and your family have made. Yes, sir, that's correct. Oh, they're just fabulous. And I understand in this modern professional hybrid shop that you use hand tools and use stationary power equipment, CNC's and all kinds of technology. Even lasers to, to bring about the best instrument we can possibly make. Here's a, a beautiful mahogany guitar body and it has this wonderful rosette here. Can you show me how you make the, the rosette? I'd be happy to do that. I'll decide what type of um, what type of instrument it is that I'm going to be building because it'll make a big difference in the actual size of the rosette. And I'll put it in a certain location using a template that we created ourselves. We then take the piece of material and we'll use what's known as a rosette cutter. I've already preformed it, but normally we'll take the template and we'll place it in such a way where the blades cut to the outside of our sound hole. And once I have it adjusted where I want it, I'll give consideration to the thickness of the material. Move the material around just to make sure that I have an even cut in depth because the table's not absolutely flat. Then I'll come back in in order to create the converse and I'll move the blades so that it will cut to the outside with one of the two blades and inside for the pocket that I've created so that I am creating a converse piece of material to fill the area. So now this ring should fit inside of this one based on its size. So what I'm going to do now is basically drop it into a sander, sand off the top so that the ring separates. And we're going to take the rosette ring, uh, place it in into uh, the pocket that we've created, and I'm going to use some accent uh, pieces to uh, help uh, to contrast the colors between the two different types of wood that I've used. The first thing I'm going to do is just go ahead and put glue. Normally 
familiar with the top of the instrument being this way. Sometimes I'll slice the top of my rosette just to help create spacing so I can shift and move around. So that just fits right in. It sure yeah. does. And I'll push the inside. And that slice in the top helps because I can move my piece of material as needed. Then I'll work all the way around just to make sure everything is seated well. How long does it have to dry? Uh, if I have, have a choice on timing, if I'm not in a rush, I normally would like to leave it a few hours, but if you're pushed, then a few moments doesn't have any negative effect. Um, usually about 15 minutes or so will help, help it set or set up. Then I'll run it right through the sander. Using our template, I make sure that it's gonna cut exactly where I need for it to, based on the pattern that I've chosen. Cut about so halfway flip it through over, it. I figured that's what we did. Yeah. We flip it over for the same reasons that we made the rosette insert the, the same way, so it doesn't tear out or chip out the back. So you go halfway in the middle got the end product. As we're building the guitar and we have bracing that holds the front and the back or the top and the back rather, um, what we're attempting to do is create a reverberation inside of the guitar. So the bracing that we put in in most cases is too stiff for the guitar to have the type of flex that it needs. And so we take the bracing and we, uh, we craft it in such a way where it allows the top and the back to move as the strings are strung on the guitar. That being said, what I'm going to attempt to do is bring down the height of this bracing. And knowing that you're a woodworker, I thought maybe it'd be a, a good uh, opportunity for you to lay hands on the guitar and uh, see what you think about it. I'm up for it. Let's see what happens. All right. Well, I'll, uh, uh, I'll say that in most cases, what we're trying to do is take a sharp chisel and scallop down the side of our bracing and so that it tapers in such a way that when we uh, join the top and the back to the sides of the guitar, it, uh, it reduces the material enough that we can um, bond it from the sides to the back. Exactly like that, great job. Thank you, this is fun. You know, I think uh, making a guitar is probably on many woodworkers bucket list. Well, I'm ready for some CNC and some laser. Well, that sounds great. Let's uh, go see my dad and he can walk us through all the ideas that go along with it. Hey, Kevin. Yes, sir, Chuck. This looks like a laser show. Yeah, it's Tell what it is. It is a laser show. Let me open it up and show you. The laser actually is working off of XYZ coordinates. So this is the head, and it moves back and forth very fast, back and forth this way. And it's got a mirror in it, and a lens. So it comes from the rear of the machine, comes to a 45 degree mirror, comes down to here, and it hits another 45 degree mirror, to a lens which forces the light to go straight down. We have designed a template with CAD. Okay. And then what we've done, we've taken the CAD drawing and transferred it to a file that the laser can use. 
and then once we've got the file, the laser begins to cut it. The way we've designed the program, it'll do all the text first, and then it'll come back and it'll do what they call the, the vector cuts. It'll actually literally cut it out. So you've got your text, and you can put any kind of text you want on it, and then you literally cut out whatever you want to cut out. And so all the information you need is here. Correct. So where all you'll do is place it on whatever you want and trace over it. Now this was all done by hand before. Uh, what, the, the back and the front? Correct. And then F5, F5 mandolin. mandolin. Correct. Yeah. And so uh, in order to be able to get that arch top that you want or arch bottom, uh, now you can do it with CNC. Correct. How's you have that to, done? You have to draw it first with CAD and you use the 3D type program and it allows us to do all kinds of shaping and forming. And a lot of these curves are mathematical. So when you get to drawing them, the curve will only work certain ways. Well, the curves are different in different Correct. places. Different yeah. instruments, and then they have recurve too, which means it comes back up. So the top in reality will actually be a little thinner right here, and mm -hmm. that allows that top to vibrate. So it's gonna choose a tool. It's choosing a tool. In, in the software, we have to actually select the tool. That's a drill bit it's picked up. This is the end result, Kevin. Tell us what we've got here. What we have is a carving that is done on the CNC. It's a BS model, 16 inch. And what we do sell these for is for people to use on their dupla carvers. And on the dupla carvers, uh, this will speed up all the hand carving that they've been doing or chiseling they've been doing. And uh, it, it adds just huge amounts of time for them. Well, that's wonderful. I just love the way you have used well, thank you. hand tools, uh, new technology and power tools to create guitars and tools for other luthiers. Thank you. Thank you. These are the Dovetail Saw Guides by David Barron, made from anodized aluminum. And they have a magnet in it. That's the genius of it that allows the saw blade to stay up against the guide when you make the cut. Well, that's nice. And I wondered how they manage to uh, keep you from just sticking to the magnet. This is some slick material Yeah, here. it's like that little thin membrane that's super slick. So the blade stays up against it, but moves pretty effortlessly as you saw back and forth. And it looks like some sandpaper's attached here, so it will you hold. You can just hold it, yep, just hold it, and it stays in place. It comes in a range of different ratio cuts for hardwoods to softwoods, from one to four all the way to one to eight and also a 45 degree, a 90 degree, and then there's a unique dovetail spline as well for reinforcing 45 degree miters with uh, small little splines. That sounds great. I'm going to take this home with me and I'm going to try it in the shop and see if it improves my dovetails. Coming up! Fine Woodworking's John Tetro has some conventional joinery tips when working with unconventional wood types. My parents wanted me to go to college, so I appeased them. He was lured into marine biology in college, but the tide would eventually bring him back to woodworking. A moment with master furniture maker Robert Johnson. You're watching The Highland Woodworker. I'm just an average, down-to-earth woodworker. On a scale of 1 to 10, I'm probably about a 5. But one place I score a perfect 10 is right here, and I plan on keeping all 10. That's why I have a saw stop table saw, and there's more. Plenty of power, superior dust collection, and absolute accuracy. These features have made it the best selling cabinet saw in America. Let Highland Woodworking help you put a saw stop in your shop.
Woodpeckers, makers of fine woodworking tools like router tables, precision router lifts and fences, plus measuring and layout tools including squares, rules, triangles and more. We offer unique clamps like box clamps, the knuckle clamp and XMAT system. Our one-time tool program offers woodworkers innovative new tools. Woodpecker's precision tools are made and tested using state-of-the-art equipment. Woodworking tools from Woodpecker's. Tools you can trust for generations to come. Introducing the ultimate flush trim router bit by Whiteside. Get CNC quality cuts from your patterns every time. Whiteside, industrial grade and American made. What is quality? Is it quick? Forgettable? Easy? No, it isn't quick or easy. It isn't forgettable. Quality takes work. It takes time. Quality lasts. And it starts at Bell Forest, a leading global supplier of figured and exotic woods. Order online at bellforestproducts.com. <laughs> Woodworkers count on American-made forest saw blades for smooth, quiet cuts every time without splintering, scratching, or tear-outs. The famous Woodworker 2 is the all-purpose combination blade. But for special cuts, Woodworker 2s are available for cutting dovetails, for flat bottom joinery. A 30-tooth blade is perfect for ripping, a 48-tooth blade for superior cross cuts, and a finger joint blade set. There is a perfect forest Woodworker 2 for every table saw cut. Highland Woodworking has been a leader in woodworking education for more than 30 years. They offer all kinds of woodworking classes year round, ranging from how to hand cut dovetails and mortises to how to sharpen a plane or a chisel, how to build a cabinet, a chair, or a bookcase, or how to turn a wooden bowl. There are classes on wood finishing, French polishing, and even antique furniture restoration. For a list of upcoming classes that may interest you, just look in their catalog or go to highlandwoodworking.com. John, this is such a beautiful cabinet. I, I love the reclaimed wood and, uh, and the way you, you worked it from the rough texture out to just a beautiful finish. Uh, thanks. Yeah, one of the things I really enjoy about working with the reclaimed wood is you really get the story of the wood visually. Um, without even saying anything, you can see that this um, had a lot of time spent creating that undulating finish. It's weathered. Yeah, that, yeah. these were barn boards, um, and that's just from years of rain running down the vertical grain. Um, and you can still see some of these kind of horizontal lines that are the original saw marks. So those were a little bit proud of that surface, um, and just wearing away, you get that. The, the two lines working together. Yeah, what a great surface. Now, uh, I know the joinery has got to be difficult because uh, you've got dovetails and, and you've got some, um, some tenons here uh, for shelves and so forth uh, because this is not a great surface to, to register off of or to reference. Right. Tell me how you do that. But well, that's another joy in, in working with the old wood is um, it's a little bit of a challenge. And that for me is the fun part of kind of problem solving and figuring out ways to work around it. So you can still, you know, keep this exterior um, just simply by creating some reference surfaces to be able to cut square joints. So for example, this would be the back edge that you won't see, it'd be against the wall. You just make sure you have a nice straight back edge, joint that, and then you can use that against your, uh, you know, against your fence to cut a 90 degree angle on the other end, and then you have a square back edge 
where you can then lay out and cut your joinery. So you're creating your reference points. Yep. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. And it works the same way with, um, you know, this example is the pins for the, uh, the top of this cabinet here. Um, another example would be this is the shelf inside where you can see where you keep this surface here just with a rabbit plane, took off that outside patina and then you can cut tenons and uh, you know same thing on the underside so you're having a consistent thickness but leaving the, the patina on both sides. And you do that by hand? Yep and it's really just a couple of swipes because you're, you're not really getting it down to take you know to remove a lot of material you're just removing a 32nd or a 16th of material just to get a flat surface. And so you have housing for the, uh, the shelf and the tenons here. Yep, yeah, you can see how this would just fit right in there. And nice, and they stand proud and, and, and you can see them. Yep, this will actually, once that's socked in there tight, that'll stand proud about a quarter of an inch and you can see on the other cabinet, I'll just chamfer those tenons so you don't have to be planning anything smooth with the outside. Yeah, well that's so nice. So working with this reclaimed wood, a lot of it comes down to just creating flat square surfaces to cut the joints in. So one of the easiest tricks um, is just take a little scrap of wood, really. I, I made this into a square so I can just line it up for doing this often. But any just block of wood that you can use for a straight edge. After you have your back edge jointed, you can cut uh, a 9 degree end on your board. And then I'll just set the marking gauge to the thickness of the board we'll be joining it to. Scribe a line here. pretty good. So you can proceed to do whatever joinery you need to do from a surface like that. Yeah, so now you have a square back edge and this is flat where you can now lay out your dovetails if you're joining this um, you know as a top of a cabinet or something. You would just from here lay it out and cut your joints the same way. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, great. That's exciting. I'm gonna go out and take down a barn. <laughs> Coming up! Here's a square mortise. We're going door to door with master furniture maker Robert Johnson. You're watching The Highland Woodworker. Highland Woodworking stocks a wide selection of Rikon power tools known for their innovative design and rugged durability. Highland has sold thousands of Rikon's industry-leading bandsaws with sizes to fit every woodworking need, from the compact affordable 10-inch model to competitively priced 14 and 18-inch models. Shop us also for Rikon's reliable planers, lathes, and professional low-speed grinder, all with an exceptional five-year warranty. Rikon. Power tools. For 35 years, Lee has manufactured the world's best joinery jigs. From our award-winning dovetail jigs and mortise and tenon jigs, to newer innovations like router table jigs. Easily add strong, beautiful joinery to your woodworking pieces, like half-blind dovetails, box joints, mortise and tenon joints, and through dovetails. Lee, simply the easiest and most versatile router joinery jigs. Are your tools Tormac sharp? Tormac, consistent, reliable, and razor sharp. Tormac, sharpening innovation.
If you can't make it to Highland Woodworking in Atlanta, Georgia, you can shop online at highlandwoodworking.com. They're great at getting what you want to your shop quick. Moment with a Master is brought to you by Woodpeckers. From contemporary to traditional furniture, Robert Johnson does it all. With more than 40 years experience in creating and conserving, he is the go-to master woodworker in Memphis, Tennessee and beyond. Memphis, Tennessee is known all around the world as the birthplace of rock and roll and the home of the blues. But on this sunny day, we thought a little bluegrass music would be good for the soul. Spend any time with notable furniture maker Robert Johnson and you will find that he can handle a banjo with the same authority as any woodworking tool. Robert started working wood early in life, and four decades later he has built quite a business. He has been commissioned to research, develop, and execute many different styles of furniture, and it's all done right here in this spacious workshop. I just grew up around it, so I didn't really have a choice. It was more that it picked me. Both my grandfathers, my mother's father and my father's father were both woodworkers. Both had shops. And so earliest memory was a pile of sawdust and some odd shaped blocks. You know, spent many, many hours on the outfeed of a table saw or the planer uh, catching boards. Well, so they were all supportive of, of your efforts. Did they, did they set you down and give you some little jobs to do? We or? had plenty of jobs, but it was at the early part, it was more of a, a, a weak mind and a strong back. I mean, I was, I was there to work, and, and they could get a, you know, a, an odd job out of me. They, they put me to it. Well, I understand this is a very special piece. As a matter of fact, it is. It's my first piece. I was probably seven or eight years old and um, I was needed something for Christmas for my father. So I found a, an old chair leg and, and uh, put this together for him and painted it. And uh, you know, it's still together, still works, holds all our screwdrivers and uh, I'm actually very proud of it. So you headed from this environment uh, into yeah. biology, marine I, biology. I, I, try, I tried to break out, I, my parents wanted me to uh, go to college, so I appeased them. Like to fish, so I decided marine biology would be good for me. So I did uh, went through school, got the bachelor's degree, uh, worked in the Gulf of Mexico for two years, and then in Alaska in the Bering Sea for two years as a biologist. But uh, when I moved back to Tennessee, I just picked up where I left off and uh, started with uh, uh, furniture and doing carpentry work, and then got a shop. And I feel at home here. Uh, you know, it's not a hobby, it's a profession. We, we've done it a long time. Robert Johnson and his work are a big deal in the South Main Arts District. He is one of the artists who has made a lasting impact on this community and across America. Tell us about your work. Well, we can, we like to think we can do a lot of different styles and uh, we certainly spend a lot of time researching if it's a table, a federal table, but we do architectural pieces, doors, mantles, but then we also do chairs and beds and residential type pieces. You employ a number of uh, artisans. I do. I've been very lucky in that respect. I've uh, had some really top-notch European craftsmen come through here that had gone through the, the guild system, the journeyman and the master level. And so they brought so much to our business uh, and just being around them just by osmosis you pick up. Uh, and there's a certain rhythm when, when you have several people and everybody's really uh, on. And there's certain days when, when you can just feel the rhythm and everybody's in that, uh, that groove and moment that it's a, it's, it's a good thing. This is our reclaimed cypress, and it's already got some of the character marks. So you built this door? This is one of our doors, yeah. And uh, it's I got, thought it was 150 <laughs> good, years old. Good, yeah. mission, mission accomplished. Um, it's got a, a through mortise, we pegged those. Uh, you know, we 
you know, a door is a door. It depends on how you put your molding on and how many panels you put and in And so it. this is just a different finish. It's, it's just a, a lighter finish. Same thing, cypress. It's got the, you know, the iron stained nail holes in it, some of the imperfections. Our doors start with just um, a very simple time-honored uh, system of a through mortise for our, our interior doors. And you make the, uh, the frame first, your rails and styles, and get those joined together. Do you mortise them all by hand or have you got some special? I've got something special. You're going to want one of these. It's a Maka machine, M-A-K, made in Germany. We spent a lot of time hand mortising and then we got the Maka and it was all over. It cuts, it oscillates as it comes into the wood. Here's a square mortise. That is amazing. It's done. So if you've got eight doors, that's 64 mortises, you can do it in less than an hour. All right, so you have a through mortise and you actually wedge them. We do. We, we uh, cut that uh, tenon and then drive two glued wedges in there and it keeps the pressure. You can immediately take the clamps off, lay the door down, stack it level and move on to the next one. Well, Robert, it's not just classical, traditional furniture that you do. You've got this interesting contemporary piece you're working on. We found these uh, Clara Walnut slabs. Uh, they're book matched. Uh, they've got a lot of fiddle uh, grain to them. And we brought it in, uh, made a mock-up for the base and, and made it so it's a little adjustable and we can get our proportions just right. And this was kind of where we are I believe uh, we can start cutting wood on this one. Well, I notice you've got it sitting on a trash can at this end exactly. because uh, this little mock-up base would hold not it. hold it. No, it, absolutely it, not, and attached to the carving bench at the other. But it gave us the 30 inches from the floor height we needed and then allowed us to uh, change our proportions under here. And this is about the third or fourth rendition of what, what we're going to be the final product. Let me just show you what the final is going to be, Chuck. This is uh, just water, and you can see it's got that great fiddle. Uh, oh, it does. Just running all through. All the way down. Yeah. It's almost going to look like a hologram. You'll be able to look exactly. down into it. with. And we're going to leave the crack down the middle, so when you walk in the room, it reads as two large, big, giant pieces of wood. Yeah, that'll really speak. It really will. This is great. Music. Uh, have you got any ideas about uh, the role that music plays in your woodworking? You have to focus 100%. It's like turning or mm -hmm. carving. You really have to be in the moment. Mm -hmm. And as a musician yourself, you know that when, when you're on and, and you've got a performance, uh, you have to be right there and keep mm -hmm. up. I have a friend who's a concert violinist out of the uh, Omaha Symphony. She, she practices or rehearses eight or ten hours a day which is exactly what we do here. You know, and then you deliver the piece of furniture and go play the, the show, but it's, it's, uh, it's years and years and years of practice. What are your specialties? What really makes Robert Johnson shine? I know it's a business, but there's also uh, something that you really put your heart and your love into, and you love to see this kind of work coming. What, what would it be? I, I like to carve. It's uh, it's you, because you've got all the design and all the light, and we get to use kind of the same tools and techniques that have been around for several hundred years. That being said, uh, it's hard to be fast enough to do that. To, to, you have to to stay ahead of that uh, dollar. Uh, but but what I, I really like to do is carve. I've kind of gotten over building the big pieces and the big tables and the big this and big that, and I prefer to spend a lot more time on something small. What uh, would you like your legacy to be as a woodworker and as a person? It would be great if someone in 150 or 200 years picked up a piece of our furniture, turned it over, there was our name and the date, and, and they knew that it was made by you know, a man's hands and had, had, the joinery was correct, it was still together. I think that's the legacy, that it's still there. So I, I would get some comfort in knowing that, that that's a possibility, and I, I, I believe it is.
Well, that's great. I'm using the David Barron dovetail guide, which helps me with my sawing. One of the problems in cutting hand cut dovetails is sawing a straight line. And the recommended saw is the Gaiyu Kucho saw. The Gaiyu Kucho saw, uh, like most Japanese saws, has very little set here. And it just cuts and tracks very straight on a pull stroke. It also is tall enough that coupled with the guide here, will let you cut a three quarter inch board without kind of bottoming out on the back of the saw. So these two are gonna work very nicely when I cut my dovetails. To learn more, go to our tool tours at the top of thehighlandwoodworker.com. You can find out all you need to improve your dovetail. Improve your woodworking experience. Sign up for Wood News Online, a monthly newsletter showcasing the latest news, tips, and classes Highland Woodworking has to offer. By signing up, you'll receive the latest episode of the Highland Woodworker, special store promotions, and Wood News Online delivered straight to your inbox. Sign up today. Well, that's all the time we have for this episode. Follow us on our social media channels as well. And until next time, I'm Charles Brock, and I'm a Highland Woodworker.